Okay, so we're live now. We can see the attendees joining and uh, uh, we can get started actually. So uh, let me share my screen uh, and introduce uh, you and the audience to this uh, uh, activity. So this is uh, the MENA Forum for uh, Challenges in Hematology. Uh, it's a series of lectures uh, that uh, will run uh, through the year and each uh, lecture is uh, an hour and a half uh, and it'll uh, tackle one specific topic like today is uh, uh, focusing on frontline management of CLL. Uh, so we have uh, pharma sponsors uh, for uh, these lectures and uh, it's organized by the Saudi Society for Blood Disorders uh, and uh, it covers the MENA area, which is uh, the Middle East and North uh, African uh, countries. So we will have attendees from uh, all these countries. Uh, today, as I said, our focus is uh, on uh, CLL management. We have Dr. Hillman, uh, Dr. Mirvat, uh, Mir Yadul Faqi, and Dr. Haysam Khujer uh, running this meeting. And uh, this is uh, a quick uh, run uh, over the the program so we will have 25 minutes of uh, 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 CLL management uh, by Dr. Uh, Peter Hillman uh, then 15 minutes of questions and answers again some from the panel and some from the audience uh, we will uh, run over three cases uh, next to that uh, each case will take 10 minutes uh, plus five minutes of questions so it's an open uh, discussion uh, one by Dr. Mirvat, uh, one by me, and uh, one by Dr. Khujer. And then at the end, we will have around 15 minutes of uh, questions and answers. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, uh, pharma sponsored. We have our platinum sponsor, uh, Jensen, and uh, plus other sponsors. And uh, for now, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Hillman. Uh, Dr. Hillman is a consultant in Leeds, uh, UK and he's very well known uh, for uh, chairing uh, the CLL uh, uh, research uh, at, uh, uh, in the UK uh, since I think 2002. He ha he's had a lot of uh, 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 peer-reviewed uh, papers, uh, more than 80 papers uh, regarding CLL management and diagnosis. Dr. Hellman will talk to us about uh, the frontline management of CLL. Dr. Hellman, please. Thank you, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I'll just try and share my screen with my presentation. Uh, let's see if this works. Um, okay. How's that? Can you see this? You can see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, if I may ask all the panel uh, panel members to to mute uh, when they're not talking, please, Dr. Hellman. Okay. Thank you very much. So it's my pleasure to speak to you. Uh, it's uh, half past five in the afternoon after a long day in clinic today. Uh, this is Leeds uh, on a sunny day, which is today uh, on the country near us. And these are my disclosures. Um, uh, mainly related to CLL trials that we run, both in the UK and in Leeds. We have a large number of trials. Oh, second. So CLL has changed dramatically uh, over the last four decades. I qualified in medicine in 1985, and uh, in those days, we had really isolating agents, and then in the 90s, pure analogs, and then combinations through the, the noughties, I guess. Uh, but really, in the last 10 years, there's been this dramatic increase in both our knowledge about CLL, which has been led by molecular analysis and now whole genome sequencing and epigenomics, we summarized in, in uh, uh, September in the Adobisco meeting, uh, and then the uh, targeted treatments for the disease, which I'll describe. And that's not stopping, so we're seeing combinations, which I'll briefly talk about uh, what, where the field is going over the next two or three years. Uh, and then some of the uh, novel agents, which we can discuss, uh, I won't present data on because of time constraints. The other thing that's changing significantly are, is the pa patient population. So this is a disease of the elderly, uh, median age in the UK, a diagnosis is 72, and treatment is a bit later than that. And nowadays, uh, uh, the median age uh, that people 
people survive is into their mid 80s. So, so um, people in their 70s are running marathons and are very, uh, are very fit. And so they're expecting more from their treatment. So I think the diseases such as CLL are, are becoming a bigger public health issue as there are more patients with the disease because of the aging population and there's more expectation that we can improve outcomes. And then in the middle, you can see the, the CLL trials. So in, in, in the UK, there's a collaborative group trials, MRC through to the NCRI. And you can see that we've had to accelerate our trial design to try and address all the questions that we see in CLL. Um, in many parts of the world, still chemotherapy is used um, as a standard frontline treatment. And of course, 90% of patients don't need treatment when they present. And we still only, only treat people when they are symptomatic or have cytopenia associated with the disease, then most patients would be considered unfit for fluoroamine-based chemotherapy. And of the, of the chemoimmunotherapy approaches for elderly patients, the combination of chloramazole plus abinutuzumab has been shown to be superior, uh, with a medium progression-free survival in the region of two and a half to three years in most trials, uh, superior to chloramazole with, with rituximab or, or chloramazole alone, although the overall survival uh, is difficult to show, particularly as we get better salvage treatments. It's, it's notable that uh, these patients are all, or the vast majority are progressing and are still largely succumbing from their disease. Uh, the gold standard in younger patients would be considered to be FCR until probably two, two years ago. Uh, and that was based on the work from the MD Anderson and more recently, uh, the Joe and CLL8 trial, which showed the superiority in terms of both progression free and overall survival for for the iron cyclosmab with tuximab compared to FC, as shown here. But this these trials, uh, the patients had a median age in the low 60s, and of course we'd expect somebody in the mid low to mid 60s to have a, an expected survival of around 20 years. And and as you can see, a third of the patients in this study one of my CR had died uh, by about five to six years into, treat, into treatment. So patients are still dying of the, uh, as a consequence of their CLL. If you look at the uh, prognostic markers and, and uh, I think uh, sadly as we move forward, VH mutational status is going to become an important uh, fact to, def to define which therapies we might want to use for patients. Well, patients with VH mutated disease have a better risk uh, regardless of what therapy they receive, and FCR is better for both. So uh, one element is that in the VH mutated patients, which is a, a minority, about 40% in most trials, uh, there is a plateau on the curve with about a third, maybe to 20% to a third of patients never needing treatment again. So we have to beat that if we're going to beat it with novel therapies. If you look at the data from uh, our group, this is from two large randomized phase two trials where we looked at frontline patients with FCR as the backbone with or without mitazantrone. You can see that uh, we really couldn't beat FCR as a standard by intensifying treatment, uh, but and our sort of six year survival was around um, uh, three quarters of, of patients. So still, these young patients are dying with their disease. But a strong predictor of outcome is the depth of remission. And this is seen across, we've been measuring minimal residual disease now for many years, uh, for two decades uh, in Leeds and in our trials. And consistently, if a patient achieves an MRD negative remission, and that's shown in the black curve, uh, both in terms of regression free and overall survival, this is obviously with chemotherapy, uh, patients will do uh, better. And we're now starting to see the, a similar phenomenon with targeted therapies where we drive patients into MRD negative remission. And this is going to be important if we're going to move towards a planned stopping of treatment uh, with combination of targeted treatment at the end. So MRD eradication down to the level of one, of one cell in 10,000, which can be assessed by flow cytometry or through a molecular test, it will be, become an important endpoint of treatment, I believe. Of course, the world changed about uh, 10 or 11 years ago with the observation scientifically that uh, all patients with CLL have a quite a proliferative disease driven through the B cell receptor and also have not regulation of BCL2 due to the deletion of uh, two microRNAs leading to resistance to apoptosis. And so 
these two, two pathways are seen in all patients with CLL and are, are critical to the uh, pathophysiology of the disease, also give us an opportunity to, to target uh, uh, these cells in a more specific way with I've recently been the first of these drugs, which I'll show you the latest data from, and vertical act encouraging um, blocking B cell two and encouraging apoptosis. So just going into uh, moving to um, the uh, ibrutinib, I said it was the first of the B cell with seven inhibitors alongside agilelacid, which has largely fallen out of favor because of the side effect profile. The Resonate 2 trial was a, a study we designed uh, probably about eight years ago now uh, to, to show the benefits of ibrutinib in frontline patients who are considered unfit for FCR. Uh, this is a randomized trial, and you can see from the, the control arm that, that in, the random, in the control arm we have a therapy which we would not really consider standard of care now. And that's one of the challenges with CLL trials as we move the treatment forward more rapidly, uh, our trials have to be adaptive so that we have an appropriate control. But at the time, Clamisil, when we designed this trial, Clamisil was the standard of care uh, for unfit patients. Uh, and in this trial, patients were allowed to switch over to Arutinib if they had clearly progressed. Uh, and, and the latest follow-up, and this is this trial still in follow-up, uh, over half the patients from the Clamisil arm had crossed over to Arutinib, which clearly will have an impact on overall survival. Uh, patients with 17p leaks, which I'll come on to later, were excluded. Uh, the, the trial was well balanced. One thing of note is that the VH, the proportion of patients with VH unmutated disease is relatively low uh, compared to other trials where we see 60% uh, unmutated patients. Um, but you can see that, um, that this balanced across the two arms. This is the latest follow up now, five and a half years into follow up, as in last year's EHA meeting. Uh, you can see at the time in this elderly group of patients, the median age was 72 or 73, going to the trial, 58% of patients continue on ibrutinib in the study. And the people who stopped treatment stopped largely for adverse events rather than progressive disease. So what's becoming clear is that if we treat people with our most effective therapies in frontline, we see a relatively low proportion failing due to progressive disease and it's really tolerant to the treatment that's, that's, that becomes critical. This is the latest PFS outcome showing that, uh, that obviously chloramicil has a median PFS of about 15 months, which is not bad for chloramicil compared to other trials. And ibrutinib has a significantly better uh, PFS, but it has a ratio of 14.6%. 70% of patients are five years in the ibrutinib arm um, remain progression free. And remember, this is an elderly group of patients. And only of the 21 patients who progressed in the ibrutinib arm, only eight of those progressed while still on ibrutinib. You look at the prognostic markers, uh, 11Q deletion and unmutated VH are poor prognostic markers with chemotherapy. And you can see in the blue arms of Clamisil, that's true in this trial as well. But if you look at the um, 11Q deleted patients, those randomized fibrosis in the yellow are actually better than those ones without 11Q. So we're gonna have to re-evaluate our prognostic markers. And the VH mutational state is certainly out at three or four years, there's no difference. There's relatively few patients going out further. So across the prognostic markers, uh, ibrutinib uh, is superior to, to chloramicil-based treatment. And, and it, despite a planned crossover at progression, uh, there's, there's still a significant improvement in overall survival, uh, showing that really patients don't cope with and survive this so these elderly group patients with uncontrolled CLL when randomized to chloramicil. And the hazard ratio is less than 50, is less than 50%. Showing, it, showing again that frontline treatment is, is preferable uh, to get the best outcome. We look at the side effect profile, because as I said before, this is one of the issues. We see some nuisance side effects, such as diarrhea and um, arthralgia. They tend to be, as a general rule, early on in the treatment. And as the treatment continues, these are better managed. The exception to that is the observation of hypertension and atrial fibrillation, which continues to be an issue uh, throughout the, the treatment, as you can see um, with hypertension in the fourth year and fifth year of treatment, uh, still being at, at high level. So we have to monitor our patients differently, closely monitoring the blood pressure uh, to, to reduce the, the issues. Look at the AEs of particular interest. Uh, again, atrial fibrillation, hypertension are seen throughout the duration, and we know this is an antiplatelet drug, but, but generally well tolerated. 
The study that really changed um, I boost number, I think, was the ECOG 1912 study, which HIFR initially presented at ASH in 2018, uh, which compared Ibrutinib with, with FCR. We have a similar trial, the FLIR study, which I'll briefly introduce to you later on. This was a two to one randomization. We were trying to replace chemotherapy, so rituximab was in both arms, but other studies have shown the rituximab doesn't really add uh, to ibrutinib, and uh, probably in retrospect, we would have used ibrutinib as a single agent in this trial. Uh, we're doing that in FLIR. 17P patients um, uh, were excluded, but obviously there were some people, three patients, and they had standard FCR for, in a two to one randomization in favor of ibrutinib until disease progression. Um, the median follow-up of the latest follow-up, which is at last year's American Society meeting, was four years, so relatively short for an FCR group of patients. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, most patients um, uh, had coped with the treatment well. If you look at the PFS, which is the primary endpoint of the trial, there's a significant advantage in terms of ibrutinib, the hazard ratio of 0.39 to 39%. Um, and with ibrutinib rituximab being superior to FCR uh, shown here. And in terms of um, the prognostic markers, uh, the VH mutated status, unmutated with, with the majority of patients on the right, you can see there's a very significant difference with a hazard ratio of 28%, whereas the mutated patients were a minority of the group of patients and um, has not yet reached significance, or the hazard ratio is 42%. So, Possibly the FLIR trial, which is a larger study from the our group, uh, will address the mutated uh, patients in more uh, detail uh, with more power. However, um, the hazard ratio is in the same direction, um, which suggests that with a larger trial, we might see uh, an advantage. If we look at the adverse events, these are grade three to, to five eight adverse events uh, across the two arms. We see more um, uh, cytopenias with FCR, as you might expect, more febrile neutropenia. 15.8%. Uh, we do see uh, the same side effects. So hypertension is less in these younger group of patients. Atrial fibrillation in younger patients tends to be less as to the cardiac uh, complications. So it's better tolerated. There's a single sudden death in, in this trial, uh, unlike in some of the elderly trials. Um, if you look at discontinuation, at the latest follow up, the median time of over th three and a half years on treatment. Um, three quarters of patients randomized to IR remain on ibrutinib. Um, and of those one, patients who have stopped for adverse events, the median time they were on treatment was, was about just over 18 months, 20.3 months. The reasons for discontinuation are shown here. So a small proportion with progression or death, I'll show you the survival in a moment, uh, a small proportion uh, with adverse events uh, and other reasons, as listed below. This is what happens to patients after they stop for adverse events. So this kaplamicab is from the, the, the time of discontinuation. And you can see that uh, uh, there's an almost two years median follow-up before a patient progresses, and maybe a bit longer before they need treatment. So uh, we're now exploring this as an approach, whether we can use intermittent treatment in patients, so those with, with side effects, but that, those trials are, are underway. Um, so at the moment, uh, in the four-year follow-up, 110 PFS events, 15 deaths in the arrhythmia arm. If you look at the overall survival, uh, this is showing a significant difference uh, between FCR and arrhythmia in favor of arrhythmia in the red curve with a hazard ratio of 34%. And I think this observation early um, has really changed practice in many countries uh, with the use of arrhythmia uh, in frontline uh, patients. The other study which, which uh, was uh, unveiled at this last year's ASH was the Elevate Treatment Naive study for acalabrutinib, so next generation BTK inhibitor with a more specific um, so, uh, TKI uh, pattern, so inhibiting about five different TKIs rather than 10. And hopefully, it's hoped that this will be better tolerated. This was a three arm trial against uh, Chromosol, Abinituzumab, and Acala with or without Abinituzumab with PFS as the endpoint. And you can see in terms of, and you have to remember this is a relatively short follow-up of the trial. So the median uh, follow-up follow of, this, of this study was around two years. Uh, you can see that we see less stage fibrillation, but that is a complication we see um, with time. So we have to, we don't really know the, the full issue with AF and hypertension of about 7%, but this is an elderly group of patients. Leading is still an issue, um, and we're seeing some secondary malignancies, but that's, maybe partly due to the way we report AEs and 
but the patients in the ACAR arm remain on treatment for longer. Uh, if you look at the nuisance uh, side effects with a calibrigzinib headache that uh, stands out with about 40% of patients complaining of what is usually a short-lived caffeine responsive headache. This is the PFS uh, data. This is very early follow-up, as I said, with a median fall for 28 months. Uh, but you can see that, that uh, the acalabrigzinib arms are beating uh, the uh, chloramicillin in a tuzumab arm. There is, the, the, the study is not powered to look at acalabrigzinib versus acal plus abinutuzumab. Uh, so we really can't um, make any conclusions, but the, but the trend that appears to be in favor of the combination, which is of interest. Uh, but there's no difference in overall survival, but uh, rem remembering this is a relatively short follow-up in, in a trial, even for elderly uh, CLL. So the next generation, this is the first uh, next generation trial to show a run, uh, in a randomized trial and benefit for second generation uh, BT inhibitor. There are now about six or seven randomized phase three trials showing the advantage of BTK, usually ibrutinib over chemotherapy, whether it be chlorambicil in the majority, BR with the Alliance trial, and FCR and ECOG, uh, which shows, shows that these therapies are definitely better in terms of PFS and in the ECOG setting, better in terms of, of overall survival. The other uh, treatment approach, which uh, I mentioned earlier, was venetoclax, and uh, venetoclax clearly uh, is very effective in CLL. The main uh, side effect really being tumor lysis syndrome, which we know is manageable with the slow escalation of the drug over a five-week period. Um, this the trial, which uh, has really changed the frontline approach, has been the combination of venetoclax and venetuzumab versus paramecil and venetuzumab in frontline uh, CLL, the CLL14 trial, which was initially presented um, by Kirsten uh, Fisher um, last last year, uh, the uh, the end of the year before, and this is a straight randomization with 12 months fixed duration of venetoclax, uh, six months with the venetuzumab, as opposed to 12 months of paramecil, six months with the venetuzumab. Um, the trial recruited over 400 patients, uh, and you can see the gain is a significant advantage. I put in a line which is the 12 month line when the th therapy stopped. You see the separation beyond that point with chromosome patients progressing uh, with less in the Ben O arm. So 82% have progressed to 36 months, the latest data we have compared to 50% in the chemotherapy uh, arm. If we look at the prognostic markers, certainly in the mutated, I was seeing very good outcomes with the VH mutated. The unmutated seems to be inferior compared to the mutated, but better than chemotherapy. Um, one anxiety with this. this approach, I think, is a fixed duration may not be the most appropriate for 17P, P53. You see patients in the black uh, on the right are progressing through treatment and continue to progress after treatment. And we know that we really don't want patients to escape. So uh, 17P probably should be treated with continuous treatment with a BTK inhibitor until we get more data on this approach. Uh, if you look at the side effect profile, uh, this is from the latest data at EHAR presented uh, last month. Uh, you can see we see neutropenia, which is manageable. This doesn't usually um, uh, create problems with fair band neutropenia, and we would generally manage with GCSF. What's uh, interesting, and it's, and it's very early data, but there seem to be more solid uh, organ tumors in the VOR, which is unexplained, and it may just be a statistical issue, but needs to be watched. Uh, and we're watching it fairly closely. In terms of uh, this approach with ibrutinib and, and other BTK inhibitors, we don't see the allocation of MRD, but in, with the S-class of we do. And you can see the top right of this, of this uh, slide uh, that around 70% of patients achieve MRD negativity in the peripheral blood, about 58% in the, in the marrow. Um, and you can see over time, the treatment stops after 12 months. You see the, that so there's some un unavailable data, but most patients um, are selling out to 18 months post-treatment are still MRD negative, although the latest data is falling off. And we see that uh, less MRD negativity in the, in the climate subunities map, with very few being MRD negative out beyond 18 months post-treatment therapy. If you look at the PFS by MRD, the patients who achieve MRD negativity, shown in the dotted curves, are do better, and that's regardless of what therapy. So if you achieve MRD negativity with chlorambicil, you do better uh, than if you don't achieve it with an s and that's uh, consistent for our experience with chemotherapy. 
Uh, in this trial, there's no difference in overall survival. What about 17P? Well, 17P, only if one is considering chemotherapy, is an important uh, uh, analysis to consider. And I think um, if you if if you're considering venetoxibilitizumab as a frontline, I would favour IPTK certainly in the 17P uh, patients because there are three patterns of 17P deletion: so deletion without mutation, shown in the yellow. Uh, deletion with mutation, which is the, the largest proportion, and then just mutation. So fish analysis will only show the two the two uh, groups with deletion. We need to do mutation testing to to, to find the ones with mutation. We do both, um, and that we would certainly consider doing high throughput sequencing as a more sensitive way to look for mutation. You look at the outcomes. This is with chemotherapy from David Rossi's work initially. So even those patients with small proportions of P53 mutated uh, clone clones will have a worse outcome. So subclonal in red, and if you show the right, the subclonal patient with, with a P53 small clone, mutated clone, do as badly as those with larger clones. So demonstrating they have genetically unstable disease. You look at the outcomes of that snip and frontline. This is this is from work from um, uh, Adrian Nuisa's group, the NIH. Uh, there's relatively little data, but this is out now to be on five years. All these patients were 17P, P53 deleted. You can see that the treatment-naive patients are doing much better than we've seen with any other treatment approach, whereas the reduction factor patients, as you might expect, doing worse. And this is also seen in terms of overall survival. And so that data certainly suggests we should be considering um, BTK as our frontline treatment, and that's how they are approach. I've shown this this slide already in terms of CL14, and you can see that the patients randomized for BO, the deflaxomilituzumab, are relapsing during and after stopping treatment. So I think we need more data, and then maybe we need longer treatment or more, or more combination approaches. So where are we going in the future? So I think the standard of therapy you can see is, is, is moving towards certainly targeted therapy and frontline. Uh, and the aflatabilitizumab or ibrutinib-based treatments. Uh, combinations uh, certainly seem to be the way forward. We did the priority study in relapsed patients with ibrutinib plus first class, and more recently we've seen the Captivate, which is 163 patients who were um, treated with a combination of ibrutinib plus phenetoclax in frontline CLL, and with that combination, at a year of treatment, around three quarters of patients are MRD negative in the peripheral blood and a similar number, just slightly less, are MOD negative in the, in the bone marrow, which is far higher than we see with chemotherapy uh, or with other approaches. And, and from our previous data, we suggest this is likely to lead to a better outcome. So we've, uh, we're doing the FLIR trial, which is shown on the right. Um, we, uh, we've now randomized over 1,400 patients in FLIR. The initial randomization was FCR versus IR, which we hope will be out maybe later this year. And then we now have a three-arm trial, FCR, ibrutinib, I plus V um, as a comparison, saying it's similar to the Captivate schedule, apart from the treatment can go on, is driven by the length, the time it takes to get to MRD negativity, and is guided by MRD. Uh, we should see the, the result, the other results this trial within the next probably one, well, 18 months to two years uh, we, when we have MRD data. Uh, the trial is due to finish recruitment very soon. Well, the other approach is to use a triplet, so um, ibrutinib beneflax plus abinutuzumab. This has been trialed by the German group in the GIVE regime. Uh, and again, and these, these are all 17P frontline patients. They're seeing around the three quarters of patients achieving MLD negative P in the marrow. The groups of patients are not entirely comparable, um, but just seeing similar uh, rates of remission and MLD eradication. And so the question here is whether the abinutuzumab using this type of schedule adds anything to the doublet of ibrutinib plus phenetoclax. The German 13 trial was close to recruitment at the end of last year, has four arms, uh, including VR, VO, chemotherapy, or the triplet, the same as in the GIF trial. And we would expect, I think, data, the MRD data, probably uh, towards the end of the next year in this trial as well. So I think within about 18 months, uh, we probably have data or initial data from Flair on TL13, moving the, the the combinations forward. And finally, just an algorithm of where we are in terms of the treatment. This is UK centric um, to some extent, but based on the evidence, it changes very regularly, almost by the month. Um, in the 
early stage, I mean, 90% of patients present with early stage CLL are not symptomatic and do not need treatment. There is no evidence we should be treating patients earlier than we have done in the past. When a patient has active disease and needs treatment by IWCLL, we can split them into three groups, fit, there be a fit for FCR, unfit, and the frail patients who we probably wouldn't have treated before, uh, or they would, would modify the treatment, send them with chemotherapy. Uh, for the fit patients, uh, we would want to look at mutational status and 17P or PVT3. Those patients who are BH mutated without 17P or PVT3 mutation, um, or those, sorry, that's all those patients with unmutated disease or 17P who are fit for FCR. I think the evidence would support us using an, a BTK approach, either a boost um, probably a, a, as we have more evidence for that, or a calibrosib will be coming through for the more elderly patients. Um, if they're intolerant, swapping to the other BTK inhibitor, our progressive disease, considering that that's rituximab as a standard, and then not forgetting that we can cure some patients with transplant. So I start thinking about transplant if the patient fails their first novel therapy. In terms of the patients who have good risk disease, I think there's a patient decision about whether to have FCR or ibrutinib. Um, most of my patients would choose ibrutinib because of the toxicity of FCR. And we have to accept that two to three percent of patients will be permanently damaged by FCR with secondary MDS AML, which is obviously um, very di a very difficult disease to treat. In terms of the unfit patients, unfit for FCR, um, if patients, I think VH mutation probably doesn't affect the treatment decision, but 17P does. If there's 17P deleted, uh, we should think of a BTK approach. Uh, if they are not, uh, then I think there's a choice between VO from the similar to the CL14 or a BTK. Uh, it's a late relapse, one might consider retreating, although we have very little data on this uh, with the Netaclax, or, or switching to ibrutinib or ACALA at regression, um, and then going down the same route, but obviously transplant becomes less attractive. And then finally, for the very frail patients that we might have supported in the past, uh, my approach, uh, I think, BTK inhibition is probably the best way to palliate a patient. We see very relatively rapid responses, and many patients can improve their, their quality of life and their, and their um, activity scores uh, with ibrutinib-based um, therapy. And so I would favor that over a chemotherapy approach. So in conclusion, in terms of frontline uh, therapy, um, it's clear from all the phase three trials we have thus far, the targeted therapy is superior to chemotherapy. We have more data with BTK approaches, longer data, and, we'll, and there will be more data coming with an S class uh, in the next uh, year or two. Um, the, the debate, I think, is between a fixed duration, possibly MRD guided, although we don't have those trials out yet, versus continuous therapy to control the disease. I think that's very much a patient preference. Um, I think for patients with or unmutated or PPT3 disrupted CLL, there's no doubt targeted treatment is better. I think there's still a bit of debate with, for mutated disease, although patients tend to favor a non chemotherapy approach. And the, the current trials that, are, that we'll report in the next one to two years are going to look at combinations, and they look really interesting in terms of being able to stop therapy and potentially even cure patients or have very prolonged uh, off treatment um, periods of time. Uh, so thanks for your attention. I'll stop sharing my screen. And thank you, Dr. Hellman, for the nice presentation. Uh, very thorough. So we have uh, 10 uh, to 15 minutes of questions and answers. Uh, we will uh, get some answers from uh, the audience and some from uh, our panel. Uh, so let me start with uh, two questions. Uh, uh, I saw that uh, the uh, uh, UK doesn't uh, pay for uh, ibrutinib mm -hmm. or BTK inhibitors for the uh, uh, non 17P, mm -hmm. right? even yeah, if it's uh, unmutated. So, yeah. so currently, uh, a fit patient who is unmutated, yeah. okay, you would treat with chemoimmunotherapy. Yes, I mean, I don't think it's the right treatment, but we, well, we have, a, as you know, probably know, a fairly strict um, so sort of NICE, which, which defines um, the type of treatment we can use for the, uh, most of the patients. However, having said that, the COVID crisis has changed that to some extent, and that uh, uh, the chemotherapy is 
it, it's clear that from the data that's emerging, and we'll be looking at our own data, uh, the patients treated with chemotherapy, if they contract COVID, do worse than those with targeted treatment, say with ambrutinib. And so that's been used to make an argument that we should use targeted treatment, and that's starting to come in now, at least as, a, as an interim um, thing for this year. So we, are, we do have access to BTK inhibitors uh, at the moment. Um, we're hoping that will continue. And NICE will uh, will assess a calorum, hopefully, I've reached it, so. Now, uh, for, for the mutated fit, okay, mm -hmm. uh, as you know, maybe 60% of these patients will be long-term disease-free. Yeah. Uh, we have data from the FCR 300 from uh, MD Anderson that 60% yes. can stay treatment-free and disease-free for, for about 12 years and more. Yeah. So would you prefer a targeted approach for these patients or if they are fit, you would go for chemoimmunotherapy? Yeah, so I think, I think the MD Anderson data is, is, is certainly selected patients who can you know, tend to be fit and younger and can travel to MD Anderson. So if you look at the larger, larger studies and the, the more sort of um, uh, you know, like our studies and the German 8 trial where FCR has been given, we don't see such a high plateau. Uh, so the, there is definitely a, a proportion of patients who will never relapse and uh, with FCR and will be effectively cured. And that's probably in the region uh, of 20, 15 to 20% of the whole group of patients. And that's probably a third of the mutated patients. I think most people would think rather than much higher than that. Um, and obviously that's very attractive because you've had the chemotherapy you, and you can basically get on with your, your life rather than having continuous treatment. Um, the downside is that, that we're using our most toxic therapy for our best risk patients who generally don't die of TLL. And we know, I think it, I always, when I counsel and consent patients for FCR, quota 3% risk of a secondary myeloid malignancy and AML, uh, MDS, and, and that that's very difficult to treat. And so I think we are accepting 20% of patients won't get through six cycles and if you only use FCR once, 3% will not survive because of secondary malignancies created by our treatment. And I think it's a balance between those two things. I think at the moment, we're committing patients to long-term ibrutinib um, in that group, which is obviously a, an issue, and there's obviously some toxicities. I suspect looking at the data that the uh, in the not too distant future, the combinations where we stop treatment would be, you know, targeted treatment will, will replace uh, chemotherapy and continuous targeted treatment, if that answers the question. Thank you. Well, I, I guess uh, also we have to think about uh, the financial toxicity mm. nowadays uh, with mm -hmm. uh, the turn down of all the economies and uh, yeah. the problems uh, with the economy. Uh, so uh, uh, we have I mean, some I, questions. I mean, just, 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 really, just to, to comment yeah. about that, of course, so in, in, you know, if you look at imatinib, we had the same problem with imatinib in CML 20 years ago, and now imatinib is as cheap as chips, and, and uh, yep, we're using yep, yep. and I believe it will be off patent in five, seven years' time. So, so um, it's not going to be financially toxic forever, um, and I think right. we should use the best treatment and, and have as many patients benefit. Sure. Uh, now we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, one is, how would you treat unmutated fit? Okay, mm -hmm. deletion 11Q with no access to BTK. Right, okay. That's a, so I need BTK, I've had access to BTK because it's quite clear that those are the patients who, who do the best. 11Q deleted patients with a BTK inhibitor, you know, have a better outcome than, than any other group of patients. Um, if we don't have a BTK inhibitor, we, have, we probably have little choice. Um, I mean, I'm assuming we don't have an s lax either in that, in that setting. Um, uh, I would, I would, you'd have to give them FCR in that, in that setting, but I wouldn't be comfortable with that as a treatment given what we have available. Um, we don't have any data, any solid data for venetical axe-based treatment if that was available. Um, we've done some small studies of, with VO, um, which is effective in younger patients. Um, the, it's quite interesting, actually, if you look at the combinations, and this is um, the mutated, unmutated patients do better with a, a combination with ibrutinib in it, and the mutated patients do pretty well with the with the based combinations. 
And so, I, you know, in terms of MRD eradication, so if you look at the MRD with our of Veneticlax, it's much higher than with VO for unmutated patients. And that may be because of the biology of the disease. And so I think we have to move towards BTK inhibitors in those patients, uh, alone or in combination. Okay, one uh, more questions from, uh, question from the audience. Do you switch from TKI classes based on the side effect profile? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now we have availability of, of more than one BTK inhibitor. And we've used all, all the four that have been used, trialed in trials here. Um, in frontline, the most reason, common reason for stopping abrucinib is, is AEs. And, and I think um, abrucinib has been the, the single drug that's made the biggest difference in terms of outcome for patients. And so we really don't want to, to waste a class of drugs as, as BTK. And so we have switched a number of patients from who had side effects with abrucinib to, uh, to, to an alternative BTK inhibitor. We, and and that, if it's a, one of those nuisance side effect rashes, arthralgia, diarrhea, uh, often that, that can be better on another BTK. I'm not sure it's the same with cardiac. The cardiac, I'm not, I'd, if I had a serious cardiac cap, you know, arrhythmia, I would probably favor going to venetoclax. But to think, apart from that, uh, I would certainly consider switching BTKs to that uh, rather than switching modality of therapy. One more interesting question from uh, the audience, then we'll take one question from Dr. Mirvat, one of our panelists, and proceed with the case presentations. So uh, this is interesting, actually. Uh, question, uh, percentage of disease transformation seen with BTKs and venetoclax. Yeah. So I've, I've asked this question for uh, when we started uh, to use these uh, agents, we've seen some transformation happening. But I think because other events went away, like yeah. progression, and yeah. but uh, I'll be more than happy to to hear from you. What's your experience? Yeah, I mean, I think rigorous transformation is is an issue for patients who are, who have previously been treated and are treated with targeted treatment. So, so those patients who have had chemotherapy before, particularly for thiamine based treatment. Um, and the RHS patients have largely, not always, but largely been patients who have had you know, more than one line of therapy before. I've gone on a, on a BTK uh, or, or venetoclax and I've, I've had transformation while on. And, and I think uh, there are two reasons, as you said, they're keeping patients alive longer. And so they're more likely to, to unveil a, a, a transformation. Also, you know, in patients that we had before, you know, before we had these drugs, um, who had big bulky disease, um, we didn't really chase like this. We, we, you know, we treated them as CLL because we didn't do PETs and we didn't biopsy it. So what has happened, what's happened in some patients now, you, you treat bulky disease and one bit doesn't go down and then you perhaps get an restrictus, which we wouldn't have diagnosed before, but we would have assumed it died, died of CLL. Having said that, I don't think it's different between venetoclax and ibrutinib. There was an initial story, initially a story that PSV kinase might be better. Uh, we don't have solid data on that. Um, and it's very rare in frontline. And so in our frontline trials, and we've got 1,400 patients in FLAIR, which most of our average them, we haven't seen a high rate of rigors at all. So there's no evidence that these drugs are actually creating a problem. Um, and certainly rigors is, is, a, is a big problem when we, when we see it. Another question is, do you use ibrutinib in patient with thrombocytopenia at diagnosis? Mm -hmm. what's, what's your cut off? Yeah, I mean, we, obviously, the trials were 30, and um, um, we we um, have used it in patients since license below 30. Um, if someone had that degree of bone, if it was due to bone marrow failure, um, then I might favor a venetoclax regime because it's not going to play its effect. Um, but there are very few patients who start off at that level. Uh, if it's ITP, obviously, we try and treat the ITP. Uh, Trombopax is quite effective if steroids and, and other approaches don't don't work. And if you're going to use uh, Ibrutinib in people with low platelets, say below 30, consider supporting them through the first couple of months while the platelet count improves. And so we would tend to use it, but obviously we'd balance the risks. Okay. And the last question is, we always, you know, for people who progress on chemoimmunotherapy, we use targeted therapy, yeah. uh, but uh, would you do the opposite? Like you have a patient on a yeah. progress and then 
go back to chemoimmunotherapy or so, so that's a really interesting question because we we're not get we're not seeing many patients yet and we've treated quite a lot of patients frontline um the ones that really cause a problem are the ones that that that, that just don't respond to targeted therapy and grow through it and, and that's probably less than one percent of the patients but they're genetically bad risk disease and they're not going to respond well to chemotherapy i think the challenge and it's more likely to happen in relapsed patients of course and the challenge then is, is can you get them to a state where, you, where we can transplant them if they're transplantable because, because i think there's a tendency for us to to you know we used to, i i'm not a transplanter by nature but we always transplanted five or six CR patients a year until six or six years ago probably and we've done very few since then and i think it's important to keep it in mind that if you if a patient blows through ibrutinib or well, venetoclax you know start thinking about what options you have if they fail the other one um we haven't had to use chemotherapy in our setting apart from in the rictus transform patients to date um uh, but i'm sure there will be small numbers of patients we have to do that but i'd be moving to to a more uh, sort of curative strategy quickly because they're not going to they're not going to respond well to chemotherapy all right uh, before moving uh, to dr mirvet uh, case uh, she will start with the case presentation she uh, sent a question through the q and a tab asking uh, whether uh, this is the era of non chemotherapy targeted therapy treatment for cll do you think we shouldn't use chemoimmunotherapy anymore I think, I think it's fair to say that we won't be using it in the future and uh, therefore patients we treat with FCR now, uh, it's clear when they relapse they've got much more complex disease and much more difficult to treat and so I think we're moving towards uh, targeted therapy now and I, my belief is that you know within a short period of time we'll, we will be using combinations whether it be VO or, or IV uh, as a combination uh, which will be Financially toxic in the first year, but then we'll get the people into remission and stop treatment. So I think um, it's, it's very likely looking at the data that 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 that, that we'll be using fixed duration or um, or de guided duration of, of targeted therapy and then stopping rather than continuous therapy until progression. And so at the moment, if we have the option, um, I would I would favour a non chemotherapy approach. The only exception you could, as we discussed before, would be in those fit. Unmutated, uh, fit mutated patients without 17p, where we know we can cure a proportion, and that needs a careful discussion with the patient. Okay, so uh, we'll move to uh, Dr. Uh, Mirvat from uh, uh, Egypt. Uh, she has a case presentation, and uh, this will be interactive uh, uh, in between the panelists. So we have 10 to 15 minutes to go over each case. Uh, uh, for the next 45 minutes. Please, Dr. Mirbet. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. Um, and this is, is going to be a very short presentation. Uh, let me just, uh, would you like to move the slide, please? Yes, next, please. I'm not going to move the slides. This, yes. Uh, well, I will present you a 70-year-old male presenting uh, with CLL and used diagnosis CLL with 17p deletion at stage zero, right, one year ago. And he was just followed up. He was fit, but he was 70, and there was no need to treat him at that point in time. But recently, there was rapid doubling of the lymphocytic count, and the spleen started to increase in size. And then he started to develop thrombocytopenia until he reached a platelet count of 90,000. And at this point in time, I decided that maybe this is the right time to treat. And because he was a 17p deletion, I did not repeat it. Uh, and I started off with ibrutinib uh, around two months ago, full dose. He gave me a good response. The white cell count increased a little bit up front, and then it, became, they, it went down, almost normalizing. And the platelet count eventually went up to around 130, 140,000 per cubic millimeter. However, two weeks ago, he just um, sent over some uh, photos on my WhatsApp, and he said, I'm complaining of multiple echimotic patches on the legs and on the back. Uh, actually, the patient was not, re not receiving any other medication, no antiplatelets, no anticoagulation, nothing. And so let me just show you, next slide, please. 
I need you to flip the slide, please. Yes, these are what he uh, photoed. Uh, these are the legs, and as you can see, some achromatic patches. There was no other bleeding, no other RFCL bleeding or anything, but he was a little bit worried. They did a blood count, and the platelets were around 140,000, so there was no thrombocytopenia, and he was continuing the treatment on a regular basis. There were no other side effects. And uh, at that point in time, I just looked through the, uh, the internet. Uh, would you like to slip the slide, please? Another slide? Yes, and I needed to concentrate on the bleeding tendency in patients that were receiving ibrutinib. And maybe it was not the thrombocytopenia, it was the inhibition of platelet aggregation. Next slide, please. And as you can see, ibrutinib can uh, affect collagen aggregation and it can affect the von Willebrand factor dependent platelet function with decreasing these functions. Next slide, please. And it might cause uh, a decrease in platelet aggregates. This might cause some bleeding, but do I have to worry about each and every patient receiving ibrutinib? Let us look at the answer. Next slide, please. So uh, this was a paper that showed that bleeding, although it occurred in around 39% of patients, the grade three or more bleeding was minimal and that bleeding events were just contusion, some epistaxis, increased tendency to bruise or petechy, and they were mostly grade one or grade two in nearly all cases. The median time to onset of the first bleeding event was 49 days. And I have to mention that this patient, my patient, has been receiving ibrutinib for two months. And so uh, he exceeded the 49 days. The bleeding events occurred at a similar rate in patients treated with single agent ibrutinib or with ibrutinib combinations. The patients that remained on ibrutinib uh, treatment were longer than that on comparators. And so bleeding tendency, albeit mild, did not stop the patient for, from continuing ibrutinib in these uh, studies. And so the median treatment duration uh, uh, of receiving, in patients receiving ibrutinib was 11 months versus 13 months with ibrutinib uh, 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 combinations versus 5.8 months in the comparator pool that were not receiving ibrutinib. And so bleeding was not a real hazard in these cases. Next slide, please. And so I asked myself, can none, can none major bleed predict later major bleed? Do I have to worry about this patient later on? And this study showed that of 631 patients with non-major bleeding events, only 4.4% experienced subsequent major hemorrhage. And of the people, the patients that never had any preceding non-major bleed, 3.9% experienced a major hemorrhage. And so there was no association between a non-major bleed and uh, a following major uh, bleeding event. Of course, you have to point out that treatment was discontinued because of major hemorrhages in only 1% of all patients. Uh, of the 88 major hemorrhage events that occurred in this meta-analysis, only 30% resulting in temporary hold of ibrutinib, 1.1% resulting in dose reduction, and 25% resulted in ibrutinib discontinued continuation. However, 26% resulted in no changes to ibrutinib treatment whatsoever. And so I was faced with an algorithm. Do I stop the medication for a while? Do I continue but with a lower dose? Or do I just continue with the same dose? Next slide, please. And as you can see, this is the incidence of major hemorrhage over 24 months by three months interval. And yes, uh, uh, bleeding is more... Uh, uh, seen in the first few months of ibrutinib treatment. But once you continue with ibrutinib, then major hemorrhages are much and much less. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, 
con uh, comparing bleeding episodes with patients of CLL versus others that were receiving a brutinib for, for, for example, for mental cell lymphoma or others, uh, CLL were the least uh, type of patients to suffer from any bleeding with ibrutinib. Next slide, please. And as you can see, the curve is low and it plateaus uh, very, very, very uh, rapidly. And so if the patient is not uh, suffering from any type of bleed, probably he's not going to bleed at all. And if, even if it does, even if he does, this is a small proportion. So I'm not supposed to worry, but I have to point out to the patient that this might happen and this might not uh, pose to him a very severe problem or a, probably it's not going to be a major problem that is going to give him uh, any uh, uh, alarm. Next slide, please. And this, uh, this has been published in the last ASH, uh, co comparing 3,920 3, patient, 20 patients, all uh, receiving a brutinib. And as you can see, major bleeding was reported in only 2.29% in these cases, uh, uh, versus 1.2% in the control arm, which was a little bit higher, but still 2.29% is not a major problem. Next slide, please. Another problem is that patients with ibrutinib can be receiving other medications such as anticoagulants or antiplatelets. And I have to point out with antiplatelets that we are expecting that some of the cases can have platelet aggregation problems. And so antiplatelets might cause some more bleeding. However, with anticoagulations, warfarin should not be used with ibrutinib and DOAX should not be used with ibrutinib. And if you want to give uh, an, an immediate anticoagulant, then you have to choose enoxaparin, and uh, the platelet count should be above 50,000. And at this point in time, enoxaparin is an off-label indication. Patients should be educated about their bleeding risk. And in the event that a major bleed event occurs in a patient receiving ibrutinib, you have to stop ibrutinib and transfuse the patients with platelets, normal platelets with normal platelet functions. Next slide, please. So this is my patient two weeks later. What I did was I stopped the ibrutinib for five days, and then I reintroduced ibrutinib with a lower dose. I gave him two tablets instead of one tablet, and these are the same lesions, and they are much, much better. No more bleeding, no other bleeding from any other orifice, and the patient came to me, and he was okay. Uh, my, my point here is please make the patients uh, more comfortable with these minor bleeding episodes. As long as they are minor, they have to watch out for them. They have to avoid uh, excessive use of, or uh, use that you do not know about of anticoagulation antiplatelets, or maybe uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory with antiplatelet effects. And they should not uh, be much alarmed, but they should report. With that, I thank you. Thank you much, Dr. Mirvat. So, uh... I mean, uh, it's one of the most common causes of, uh, or uh, one of the most common side effects we see uh, when we use ibrutinib. Uh, now, uh, I don't know about stopping the medication uh, for this grade of uh, bleeding. And uh, the other challenge uh, with ibrutinib, uh, so I would uh, love to hear from Dr. Hellman. Uh, first, when do you stop for skin bleeding? Mm -hmm. And two, uh, we have quite a few cervatic patients, you know, from NASH, from hepatitis, mm -hmm. and they have a grade one to two esophageal varices. They never bled, but they do have esophageal varices. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on these? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Um, I mean, it's a very common issue. If you, if you ask patients, I mean, almost half of them, as you see from the studies, have superficial bleeding. Um, it looked like your patient had a lesion as well, a blood. We see skin lesions, neutrophilic lesions sometimes, which um, if they have many of those, mm -hmm. um, you may need to treat with doxycycline. It's quite effective to, to control that, those sort of lesions. We wouldn't stop a patient or dose reduce a patient with minor skin bleeding. We would treat through, and then generally over time, that improves anyway. Um, and so uh, that's different if it's a major bleed, obviously. You would, you'd obviously have to reverse those. The biggest issues, I think, with... Uh, the, the bleeding-ish uh, problems are uh, around procedures or trauma 
you know, if, um, stopping it before um, three to seven days before and three to seven days afterwards, depending on whether how big a procedure it is. Um, in terms of anticoagulation, it is a challenge because obviously we see atrial fibrillation and, and many of the patients are elderly and therefore need to be anticoagulated. So, so our approach has been to use a Pixaban as our as our favourite um, anticoagulant to, uh, with um, with ibrutinib. Uh, we generally would go for two and a half milligrams twice a day because so, we can dose reduce if necessary. This is a real strong reason to anticoagulate. But certainly for AF, we would use um, a Pixaban. Uh, you can't really give heparin for the, as long as you might want to give it. Uh, I think the bleeding risk is similar. Uh, cross BCK inhibitors, are, that's one of the side effects. I don't think it differs between um, zonibutinib, acalbutinib, and ibutinib. Um, and in terms of major hemorrhage, we see the same same proportion. And not often it's traumatic if we see a major hemorrhage, actually, rather than, oh, there's another reason. Varices would worry me um, in terms of a uh, patient with significant varices. And I think. Um, in that, in that context, I'm, and I see a lot of this with, um, uh, in PH, I see <laughs> um, that you, you'd want them to be to be treated, make sure that the, the pressure's kept down um, uh, in the portal hypertension and, and if necessary, banded or injected so that you reduce the risk of them bleeding if you have to use a BTK inhibitor. It may favor, if I had some almost significant varices, uh, I would probably nowadays favor of an s class approach and not put them at risk. Uh, although we don't have a lot of hepatitis in the UK, so uh, we, don't, we, we haven't seen a lot, a lot of those patients. We have treated a number with hepatitis and ibrutinib uh, um, together, which it can safely be done with uh, um, Takavir um, treatment of the hepatitis if necessary. Um, okay, thank you much. I think uh, uh, the time is up for the first case, so we'll move to uh, the second case. Uh, and I'll present that case. Please let me know if you see my screen. Yep. Oh, this is uh, the different slide set. So let me go to the correct slide set. Uh, this one. Okay, so this is my case. Uh, so basically, this is uh, an elderly male, uh, stage one CLL in 2012. Uh, he had cabbage in 2010, and he has hypertension history. Uh, he was treated for ITP in 2015, and then uh, his ITP recurred in early 2019. So he responded to steroids, but then his uh, count will uh, would go down. Uh, and uh, by that time, he was referred to us uh, in mid-2019. That was his count, 27,000 white BCs, hemoglobin 13.8, and the platelet 22. So we did a bone marrow biopsy. The cellularity was 20 to 40 percent, may guess, were adequate in number, and the flow showed a population of uh, CLL cells, kappa restricted. Cytogenetics. Uh, showed a trisomy 12 and 8% of the nuclei. Uh, he was asymptomatic uh, as far as night sweats, weight loss, or fatigue, and he had very small lymph nodes uh, throughout uh, his body, but uh, nothing uh, big or uh, bulky. Uh, so they were about the size of 1.5 centimeter. So basically, we have an elderly stage 1 CLL treated twice for ITP, and now platelet count is, uh, is low. Now, uh, the reason I presented this case is I was confused about the cause of uh, thrombocytopenia. I mean, the marrow and peripheral blood don't go very well with ITP. We don't have like hyperplasia of the megakaryocytes. We don't have large platelets on the peripheral blood. Still, the patient is thrombocytopenic. I cannot explain this thrombocytopenia by the, the level of involvement of the bone marrow. Uh, so. I'd like to hear from you, Dr. Hellman. What's what's your thoughts about this? And, and did you see any response to steroids at all in terms of pain? Uh, he did respond the first time with complete hematologic remission, yeah. uh, and for a few years. The second time, uh, his platelets went up to a level of 120s and hovered there up until he presented back to us. Yeah. So I mean, I think I think you have good evidence. This is this is uh, an ITP. 
case on the background of CLL. Um, you've got response to steroids. Uh, you've got at least visible normal numbers, perhaps to megakaryocytes, um, and in an elderly patient. And, and the, obviously, the marrow is not not replaced by CLL. Although clearly, there's a significant infiltration. So, so I think you've got good evidence that 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 have got high degree, and you also um, you know, the patient's clearly not, not symptomatic from his CLL. And so I don't think there's an indication for treating uh, his CLL per se. Um, and I think uh, you, we need to go on to sort of start, uh, the second line treatments for ITP um, for those, these patients who are refractory to um, steroids. The only other thing I'd say is that um, uh, if he's otherwise well um, and, a, and isn't bleeding excessively, uh, platelet count 22 doesn't trouble me too much in, the, in ITP, but it's a little bit low, makes me a little bit anxious. Uh, so I probably would try and treat him. So this guy is caught yet, and mm. uh, he had cabbage in 2010. So he was on aspirin and mm. he had some ecchymosis. We stopped his aspirin, and still he did have few ecchymosis. Mm. Uh, now, uh, would you look for something else as a cause of this ITP, like beside? Uh, his CLL? No, I mean, maybe I'd, I'd be interested to know the size of his spleen. Um, it sounds like it didn't, it wasn't palpable, but um, uh, but I think uh, you know that he's got immune mediated disease because of his response previously to steroids, unless there's another cause. I mean, obviously, you do the clotting and make sure there's nothing nothing unusual going on. Um, but, uh, but you know, assuming they're not with the IC or the film looks okay, um, I would be comfortable this is, this is ICP secondary to CLL, which can be very difficult to treat, of course. Okay. So uh, this is his uh, molecular uh, profile. When he presented to us, we, did, we sent the mutation analysis. He's uh, uh, unmutated, uh, as mm -hmm. you see. And so as far as thrombocytopenia, he's had some upper GI discomfort. So we did, uh, uh, we did uh, a scope on him and he did have uh, H. pylori. Okay. Uh, we gave him triple uh, therapy, but then uh, the platelet count did not improve. Uh, mm -hmm. It went up to like 30 and that's it uh, after triple therapy. And he was still bleeding off uh, uh, aspirin. Uh, so uh, he was uh, started on IVIG actually, his platelets bumped to above 50 with the IVIG and we started him on ibrutinib uh, <laughs> and that was on 15 August 2019. Uh, uh, so we, he was on uh, IVIG and steroids actually and started in ibrutinib and then steroids were tapered down. Uh, he uh, did well. His platelets did not fully recover, actually. He went up to around the 70s. And uh, recently, I got a call from him. He's not Saudi. He's from Bahrain. So he called me and told me uh, because of the corona, he couldn't come. So on his uh, regular testing, it was 49, his platelet. So I don't know what's going on. I told him we need to do another marrow. Uh, and I decreased his ibrutinib dose a little bit, uh, but uh, what what uh, would you do? Has he responded to his ibrutinib in terms of his CLL? Is that, um, yes, yes. Uh, his, his white count normalized. Uh, hmm. His hemoglobin was normal to start with, and then his platelets went up to the level of 70s, not fully yeah. recovered. So, so I would have been inclined to to be, to treat his ITP rather than his CLL. I mean, we know that ibrutinib is safe in. In, in immune in patients with previous immune uh, complications, but um, I think I would approach it as is ITP, and, and um, historically I would have given him probably cyclosporine because that is very effective in patients with CLL-related uh, autoimmune um, either ITP or, or, or home analysis. Um, I think increasingly we're getting comfortable with uh, either um, uh, uh, L-thrombopag, which is our favourite. Um, form of metric or, or with Romoplastin, and they tend to respond very quickly in this in this case of its ITP um, to relatively small doses. So, so I would probably now um, continue as I've reached the he's already on it and he's responding, and uh, and add a uh, uh, L or Romoplastin, um, which I was your favourite one, um, uh, as a next next treatment. 
Okay, now uh, we always teach our fellows and trainees that when you fail steroid for ITP, that's an indication to treat CLL. Yeah. Uh, but I see you're, you're pushing for a second line ITP therapy in this case. Any reason for that, or what's what's your usual approach? I, th I think it, I think it's to do with the the, the activity of the CLL because we see some patients with with um, steroid refractory either immune analysis or, or ITP who have very trivial amounts of CLL uh, there, and um, uh, you know they do often respond to to uh, sort of other. So sort of salvage immune therapies. I, I wouldn't go as far as taking the spleen out. I, don't, I think that's too too much. I would treat the CLL before I got to that point. Um, Sometimes we've got patients who responded really nicely to Saxophone in this setting some years ago. He has a risk. I mean, he's got hypertension. He's had a coronary artery bypass graft. So, so there is a risk uh, to him having average Um, You know, he's got, you know, we see sudden deaths in the Alliance trial, for example, in a, in a a low proportion of patients, you know, one or two percent. But, uh, but we, the data we have has suggested that the people who are most vulnerable are those are, with treated hypertension or previous cardiac disease. So, so I think it's not without um, risk treating his with average but it's probably safer to use uh, to treat his ITP as that's his main issue. Excuse me, would you go for um, rituximab or uh, ovimetuximab? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, we don't, we've not, as a single agent, we've only used rituximab in that setting. We haven't, we don't have the availability of a binituximab, and we certainly have used that in the past. But my, uh, until recently, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, I would have gone with cyclosporine because um, we've observed that it's a very effective treatment in, in these LPD driven immune cytopenias, as long as the patient is able to cope with it. Um, and then, I said now recently I've seen some really nice responses with the thrombometric. So so I would probably be one of those two next. And then we took some is certainly an option. Um the reason we've swayed away from it a little bit is that you know it's it's not likely to get the CLL into remission. Um can help temporarily the immune the ITP, but but it's usually not a permanent uh, solution to the issue. Okay, so we have Of, of, of resolved, uh, then you can stop it for. I bleed. I felt that you know that I could, we could cope with the recurrence, and I would probably consider starting it. Okay. Uh, we have a question about uh, VTE in patients on ibrutinib. What's yeah. your preferred uh, anticoagulant? Yeah. So we would. I mean, obviously, heparin if it's acute, if it's acute from from embolism. Um, the biggest issue tends to be with AF and, and treating those, so I would switch them to a Pixaban is my is my favourite one. I think the DOAX, um, you still see bleeding with DOAX and um, and uh, BTK inhibitors, but um, I think the Pixaban gives you a bit more flexibility in terms of um, the dose and also there's less GI um, irritation, uh, which is a, a concern. Uh, so I would tend to use a Pixaban after we've heparized someone if, if that's necessary. Okay, last question before we move to the last case. Uh, so uh, we have uh, a relapsed refractory case, uh, post-FCR. Uh, patient has AFib, DOAC, uh, and on DOAX with no access to venetoclax. So he was treated with ibrutinib and did well, but uh, the, uh, the doctor is asking, would you have another approach? 
So the patients responded well to our routine with last developed atrial fibrillation. Is that right? So a patient started with AFib. Yeah. To okay. start with, he has AFib okay. and do, uh, he is on the wax. Okay. Uh, and then they, he failed FCR apparently. Okay. And okay. they had only access to abritinib. So yeah. what, what would be... I think in that setting, you know, the, the biggest danger to him is, is his CLL. Because, I mean, he's failed FCR presumably relatively recently. So you're not going to give him chemotherapy. Um, and you don't have VFS available. So, so I, I would treat him with, uh, with abritinib. I would start off with a full dose. I tend not to start off at lower doses because uh, I think we need to control the disease adequately. Um, I um, would probably uh, continue the uh, the the DOAC, um, whichever he's on. Um, if he's on warfarin, I'll switch him to DOAC um, to 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 give alongside the uh, boot snip. Um, and then manage and manage him. I probably watch him a bit more closely than normal. Um, and it obviously educates him about bleeding and things. All right, thank you much. Uh, so we can move to the third presentation by uh, uh, Dr. Haysam Khurir, uh, who is a uh, consultant uh, him uh, pathology at uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital uh, here in Riyadh. Please, Haysam. Okay, thank you, Dr. Riyad, for having me. Can you see my slide right now? Not yet. Not yet. It's, uh, oh, yes, nice. we can see it now. A few minutes, uh, a few mm -hmm. seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay, slideshow. Yeah, clear, okay. So my case is a common presentation of uh, CLL in the clinical practice. So this is 60 years old male found to have lymphocytosis. His CBC white blood cell count 41, hemoglobin 110, platelet normal 150. So when you review the, the morphology, so it shows a typical morphology of the CLL which is succorable appearance of the nucleus. But again, uh, there is some atypical uh, cells in between, but in general, this is what we usually see in, in the Saudi population. Uh, the flow, so the flow, it shows monoclonal cells with the kappa restriction, dim expression, this is CD20, uh, CD200 and uh, 23, but CD5 is negative. Mm -hmm. So, at the final diagnosis, monoclonal B cell chronic lymphoproliferative disorder is a good option. But at this stage, I would like to narrow my differential diagnosis and don't make it open and broad. I believe this, this is the first challenge in the CLL is to obtain correct diagnosis right away. And once you have a correct diagnosis, optimizing the prognostic test. So, I would like to narrow my diagnosis to CD5 negative B cell LBD. And if I want to narrow it down also and make it more closer, maybe I can say this is CD5 negative CLL variant. So right now I will give a, a little talk about the diagnostic challenges that we face it in the CLL. So if you don't get the diagnosis correct from the beginning, then you might unleash unnecessarily testing that related for assessing the prognostic marker where it may have no relevant. So the two main arm that usually we face the difficulty is the morphology and immunophenotype. So morphology in the daily practice, you, if you are lucky, you will see the typical morphology uh, of the CLL. Uh, like this, soccer ball, small mature lymphocyte, with the soccer ball appearance, which is typical CLL. But in, uh, in our daily practice, we may face uh, difficulty in differentiating CLL from the mantle cell small variant. And the, uh, at, uh, with the typical morphology, and these cases can be diagnostic pitfall. On the other hand, Typical CLL uh, cells can be easily differentiated from the mantle cell blastoid uh, and the classic uh, va variant. 
that show folded nucleus, some uh, irregularity, and the blastoid one shows the blasty morphology, prominent nuclei. So it can be easily differentiated. And the atypical feature also, one of the typical feature, presence of the large cells with prominent nuclei that could be pro-lymphocyte or maybe large lymphoma cells. Like this one, this is pro-lymphocyte in the background of mature lymphocytes. The other arm and the difficulty that we face it in the diagnosis of the CLL is immunophenotype. So although CLL and mantle cell share many of the mature B cell uh, markers uh, immunophenotypically with the apparent expression of the CD5, they have many different properties. So by flow cytometry, CLL, CLL typically, CLL typically uh, express low density surface immunoglobulin and them expression of CD20, 22, and is often negative for FMC7. On the other hand, mantle cell express high density surface immunoglobulin, uh, bright expression of 20, and uh, also bright expression of CD22, and is positive for FMC7. Most importantly, almost all MCL uh, mantle cell uh, produce cycling D1 in the nuclei, which can be detected by immunohistochemistry. Uh, however, exceptional cases are present, and these cases are potentially diagnostic pitfall. So one of these uh, pitfall is CD23 and or CD5 negative CLL. So CD23 is a useful uh, tool for differentiating mantle cell from the CLL only when the CD23 expression is uh, negative. Some cases of the mantle cell shows dim CD23 expression that overlap with the some cases of the CLL. CD200 negative uh, CLL. CD200 proved to be a useful marker for differentiation between a CLL and mantle cell by flow cytometry. But in particular, CD200 was useful in the distinguish a CLL sample with the atypical immunophenotype from the mantle cell. So almost all CLL case, the majority of the CLL case are CD200 positive, and it shows bright expression. But again, rare cases may show negative expression. So I would say near all cases of mantle cell were negative or them for CD200. Uh, so in the bottom line, never analyze flow cytometry report without correlation with the morphology. And uh, 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 this is the typical fish panel for the CLL performed at the King Faisal Specialist Hospital at the moment. And uh, it include a marker that, uh, that are prognostic marker, not diagnostic, uh, these uh, abnormalities uh, in fish can be seen in all sorts of lymphomas and leukemias and not specific for uh, CLL. So just because if the patient has trisomy 12, it doesn't mean the disease is CLL. Uh, we always do a CCND1 IGH uh, translocation to exclude mantle cell and moreover, uh, we can identify unusual uh, CLL variant by using a uh, break apart immunoglobulin uh, heavy chain probe which reflects uh, to BCL2 and BCL3 partner to look for unusual CLL uh, subgroup. Thank you. This is my talk. I was muted. So uh, thank you, Dr. Haysam, for uh, the nice presentation. Uh, any question from the panel before we move to uh, the audience question? I guess one of the questions, 
the guess the differential we'd say is well mantle is unlikely to see the five and if you've not got a cycling d1 translocation then we wouldn't probably call it a uh, an expression we wouldn't call a mantle cell the other um uh exclusion is from marginal zone to semi marginal zone in firmware and uh um, do they have a paraprotein? Do they have a mid eighty eight mutation and CSL four mutation? So, so they will be the other things we would be interested in knowing. And I think uh, in this context, um, if there's a lymph node to biopsy, a lymph node biopsy might help to yeah. uh, establish the diagnosis. Yeah, that's true. Okay, uh, we have a question from uh, Dr. Shah from the attendees about. Uh, TB and CLL patient on uh, uh, ibrutinib or targeted agent and rifampicin uh, at the same time. So how would you deal with these patients? That's a good question. I, I'd have to I'd ask my pharmacist is the first thing. We, one of the things we have in our clinic now is a pharmacist at all times. So, so I think there's an interaction between rifampicin from the top of my head and ibrutinib uh, and other because it reacts with most things, we we'll have to um, to check that out. We I'm trying to think if we've seen anybody with TB and on I recently, I can't, I can't think of any. We've seen some fungal infections and that creates a challenge in terms of uh, the azoles interacting. Uh, in that context, we use a single 140 milligrams of of, um, of uh, ibrutinib, um, but I don't have any experience of TB in that setting. I see. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the panel? Uh, okay. Another question from uh, our uh, attendees is what routine antimicrobial prophylaxis you use with uh, ibrutinib? It's also a your question. Um, and uh, so, what we do is uh, in Relapsed patients post chemotherapy, we tend to, we give cotrimoxazole um, prophylaxis if they've had previous chemotherapy. Um, in because of the, what, there was a, an MHRA report and several reports of, of PJP infection in in Aboriginal now. In my experience, most of those patients have been pre treated. So, in the context of a frontline treatment. Um, I, I wouldn't use prophylaxis for an ibrutinib patient as a frontline therapy. The exception is in, in our FLIR trial because of the MHRA warning we had. We really had to recommend prophylaxis in that trial, so we have done. Um, but uh, outside of the trial, I don't use prophylaxis. Um, I do tend to use prophylaxis in combination. So, so ibrutinib, leflax, leflax, benetuzumab. I tend to use um, acyclovir and cotrimoxol. We don't use fungal prophylaxis. I think uh, with that we come uh, to the end. I would like to thank uh, uh, all uh, the panelists, Dr. Hillman, Dr. Mirvat, and Dr. Hujer. Uh, I would like to thank SSBD for organizing this uh, activity and our sponsors, our platinum sponsor, Jensen. And uh, I would like to tell uh, the audience about uh, the availability of uh, the recorded videos on uh, the SSBD accounts on YouTube, uh, Twitter uh, as well. And uh, with that, uh, uh, we will come to an end and we will see you next week, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you.